السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الصلاة حي على الفلاح حي على الفلاح الله أكبر الله لا إله إلا الله إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستهديه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شر أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا أي يهد الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبد رسوله يا أيها الناس إنا خلقناكم من ذكر وأنثى وجعلناكم شعوبا وقبائل تعرفوا إن أكرمكم عند الله أتراكم إن الله عليم خبير يا أيها الذين اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الذين اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما. All praise belongs to Allah. We praise Him. We seek His guidance and His forgiveness. We seek protection of Allah from the evil of our own selves and our own bad actions. Because wherever Allah guides, no one can misguide. Wherever Allah leads to go astray, no one can guide them correctly. I bear witness and testify that there is no deity, there is no God worthy of worship except Allah alone, without any partners, and that Muhammad وسلم, was his servant and messenger. O mankind, know that the Lord created you from a male and a female, created you from the many nations and many tribes, many ethnicities, many nationalities. They may get to know one another. The best amongst you in the sight of God are those of the most God conscious. O you believe, fear Allah and don't die except in a state of full submission to Him. O you believe, fear Allah and always speak the truth. They may improve your affairs, they may forgive your sins. Whoever obeys Allah and His Messenger has surely already attained a great success. Amma ba'd, that's what follows. The Hijrah of the Prophet Muhammad from Mecca to Medina, famous incident, it was an inflection point. It was a moment of change. It was a big deal. There's a lot of symbolism behind it. It was a drastic and critical change in the dynamics and the movements and the rise and the fall and the power dynamics between the Muslims and the Enemies. It was an opportunity, for example, to bring about a new vision, a new set of values, a new community, a new society, a new state, a model to the world. The Prophet Muhammad first quote unquote 100 days in office, his first few steps as the newly elected leader of this city state, one of the first actions they took are very important for us to study. Very meaningful and very symbolic. And two of them are very, very, very famous, very, very popular, very well spoken about, well known. Two of the first three actions that he took in his quote unquote first 100 days in office. The third, not as well known, not as famous. Some of you might be thinking, trying to remember what it is. He did three things from the get go, right off the bat, that started at the beginning of the first ever Islamic State. Two, of course, I think you guys know this, bringing together the house and the Khazalaj, bringing together. Two different tribes have been constantly, generation and generation constantly in conflict, constantly fighting each other, killing each other off. They look at each other, they remember that you killed my dad and I killed your dad, you killed my brother and I killed your uncle. It's hard to bring people like that together. Of course, and we oversimplify, bringing them both to Islam and bringing them both to see the truth of Islam and the Prophet as the true Prophet is the beginning of the change of that. For them seeing each other differently because now they're brothers. It's not the purpose of our talk today. We'll bring it up a little bit more about brotherhood and unity in the talk afterwards. But I mainly want to focus on the third one. And some of you are thinking, some of you might know it, some of you probably still don't. But the second one, the most famous and the most talked about, 
And all means are very critical for Muslims in America. So I want you to keep that in mind. We're taking it from the past. You want to apply it today. It applies perfectly well. Number two is building a masjid. And we know that the masjid of the was a lot more than just a place for prayer. But of course, primarily it's for prayer. Just for Adhan and for prayer. It's a place to eat together and break your fast. And there's a place for a lot more diplomacy and, and da'wah and, uh, and relations and people to come visit and to answer questions and to fiqh and a thousand other things. Counseling and mediation. Uh, these are modern terms, but also did all that and much more. He was an advocate and a counselor. We sometimes say that he's a revolutionary and he's a leader. We use these terms because you know they might sound good, they're buzzwords. We rather say he's a prophet, so it's bigger than any of these things. These are all small words, but he did all of that. The message was essential to all of that, including bringing armies together and defending the Muslims when it was necessary. All of that was started from the Majid. And you guys have heard all this before. Number three, I'm wondering who, who knows it. We'll find out afterwards, inshallah. We'll talk after the couple. The third thing he did, which I've never in my life heard a hutbah about, as far as I can remember, is it's relevant to Palestine today, it's relevant to the American Muslims today, it's relevant to all of it. And I want to focus on this. He established the Muslim market. Business. I'm going to ask you to raise your hands. What's allowed in a football? That won't make you uncomfortable. Who's ever heard a football about money and business? Besides, don't let your business and your money take away from the worship of Allah, which of course is a good message. I've heard that in the and groups and and lectures. And I've heard, don't let the worldly life consume you 100%. You're going to die any day now, you can't take your money with you. It's a fact. But is that the full picture? There's more to it. How about the fact that three of the top 10 of all the 100,000 companions, I don't know if you know this, but if you take the widest circle of companions, it started with Rasul Salaam, Khadija, a few people. By the time he was done and he had passed away, وسلم, and he had done Hajj, and basically all of Arabia was under the Rasul Salaam, you could estimate 100, 120,000 people were companions. Right? 120,000 people were Sahaba. Now they're not all the same level, but there's 100,000 people in the widest circle. From them, the 10 are the top, and there's other levels. 10 Thomas Jannah while they're alive. You know this. Asha al Mashim Jannah. From them, the three of those 10 were wealthy, 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 wealthy by our standards today and by their standards today. They were Jeff Bezos, Mark Zuckerberg, Elon you know, Musk, well, that's a big insult, but both whites of Arabia at that time. Not the world at that time, to be fair, because the Romans and the Persians, the next level, the Arabs were tribes running around the desert. It's not, they, weren't, they, they weren't as influential and as relevant as the empires, and in fact, they weren't even considered worth colonizing. I mean, that's a tangent, but I'm uh, fascinated by history, but without Islam, of course, after Islam, they became the, the, the dominant force on the planet, and absolutely relevant. Everyone else became relevant. But, the, 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 among the most influential, the most relevant, and most powerful people in Arabia, three of those top people were from the top ten companions of Muslim. Why am I saying this? Why am I focusing on this? So clearly, then, you had, like I said, you know, money shouldn't be swayed you from the worship of Allah. There's ayahs in the Quran about coming to Jum'ah, you should do your business. Of course, uh, if you're doing business or doing anything else, playing chess, playing checkers, playing video games, watching whatever it is, there's prayer time, that could be a sin, even if it wasn't a sin, and so on and so forth, right? And then you die, you don't take your money with you. Okay, but how about that? And how about the fact that among the top, not just one of the 100,000 companions was a businessman who could be like, all right, well, he's not the best companion, and you know, maybe the, you know, Prophet Salah forgave him, Allah forgave him because he did other good things. No, no, three of the top 10 promised Jannah in their lifetime were wealthy, wealthy, wealthy businessmen. So how do we reconcile these two? Everyone's in view? Am I the only one that thinks about these things? I do. I grew up, last few years I kind of had the answer, but growing up it used to confuse me. I was like, as Muslims, we want to be powerful and influential and money to do good with it. We want it in a halal way, we want to do good with it. But every hope that this kind of is about how we shouldn't be attached to the world. I said, how do you reconcile them? The good news is absolutely, they're not irreconcilable. There's no contradiction. And Imam Nawi is probably the best to ever put it. It's a famous quote, I'm sure many of you have heard of it. Imam Nawi is among the most famous, if not the most famous a scholar in our history, the actual companions and the first generations and so on. One of the most loved and respected, the 40 hadiths of Imam Nawi, the eldest of Hain, one of the top scholars in our history. And every madhab and scholars of every denomination and sect, they all recognize and love him. But he said, Zuhud, which is his concept of being ascetic, which we don't use that word, but not of this worldly life, but obviously being materialistic, right? And hedonistic. And it's part of our deen. And the prophets, all of them, including Sulaiman who like literally ran the whole world. Prophet had power and influence towards the end of his life. Sulaiman had, uh, what is it? Mulkin la yabaghi He has, I want an empire. He asked Allah for an empire that no one ever had, ever will have on this planet, and Allah gave him that. So he didn't just have, think of it like if he had all the money on the planet, which no one can, right? He had all of it in one person's hand, impossible. All the power that like he run all 200 countries. But even that, but then the jinn and the animals work for him, like, you know, no one's gonna ever have that. But him and all the other prophets, they're all to have. They're not attached to the worldly life. You see? There's, there's two, different, two separate concepts. And it might be tough to put them together, we'll try our best. And, and I know the way he said this, and to go back, he said, have the worldly life, have this dunya in your hands, but not in your heart. Now obviously it's easier said than done. It's a few words, but that's what we're trying to do. Have it in your hands, not in your heart. If you have no money, no fame, no status, no except Allah can still love you, you can still be a great person, fine. But like, are you really a Zen? Maybe not, we don't know. There are four, can it be possible for a person who's poor and powerless and weak? To be in love and obsessed with money and power and stuff? It's possible. Is it possible for someone to be rich, famous, etc., and he doesn't really care about these things? Or she doesn't care about these things? It's possible. 
Sayyidina Alayhi wa sallam among the companions, and of course other examples, modern and present, modern and past examples. So the point is we do want money, we do want power, we want influence. I'll be lying if I say I've been posting consistently for five years on Instagram, and I wouldn't rather have a billion followers than 7,000. Of course I'd rather have a billion. Especially, unless, unless it means that I'm going to, it could be a fitna, of course, and of course it could lead to something negative. Assuming that I know that all those posts are going to bring me good deeds, of course I'd rather have a billion. When you start working in this company, you guys are like 20, 22, etc. When you get your first job, you'd rather that first salary be 100k or 60k. You're gonna lie and be like, I don't care about it. Like, well, our deed doesn't tell you that. Nothing our deed says that you have to like want less money, right? There's no ayah that says that. Now, I'll be fair, because I know some of you are thinking this is not at all what you've heard of football swimming up. Is this even a football? I understand. I've attended thousands of football swimming up. I watch like three, four a day, a week on, on, online, and I attend at least once a week. You know, first time, sometimes multiple. Sometimes I get multiple in a week. I've been studying the topic, just bear with me. <coughs> What was I saying? A billion followers, a billion? Lost my train of thought. But, anyways, uh, but that was a tangent, a tangent, a tangent. We'll go back. The Muslim market. The Prophet established the Muslim market, and what that did was, be began to, takes, you know, he established it, it's a day. These are our policies, these are our rules, it's the fit behind finance, right? It's a new way of thinking, a new lifestyle. He began the transition of power and money into Muslims' hands. Because these are our brands, these are our products, these are our services. We don't do interest, we don't lie, we don't cheat, we don't see it. We have contracts that are not 500 pages where we know that no one's going to read it, we just sign at the end, and then all, they got you in court. Right, that's not Islamic, even though Muslims do it today and everyone does it today. It's like the global system. It's completely against the Prophet spoke about that. You would be surprised if the Prophet spoke about contracts and you know the fine print and the fact that it's not going to spoke about that at that time. And he said, from Muhammad Muhammad ibn Abdullah, etc. This is a contract between me and you, etc. These are the few things. It's a one page, big font, clear, concise, everything is simple words. You don't need 500 pages. Most of these contracts that are 500 can be like a page or two. Maybe it's a page and there's a few other points and they spread out over 500 words. This is nonsense. Just, just throwing out a few examples. But the fact is that we have a different way of seeing business and money. Money is not evil. We want good money in good hands. But how do you earn it? How do you spend it? Similar with fame. How do you earn that platform? And then what do you do with that influence? But fame is not haram. If someone told you that fame and money is haram and you go for that notion, they probably were a sincere teacher, a scholar, imam, parents, or someone that told you that. They probably were sincere. What they meant is don't let those things consume you. There's hadith about that. The wolves and the sheep. But it's not technically true. Money and fame is not evil. Cross on us. Very influential and very, very famous. He's the most famous person in human history. So he established the Muslim market and taught people the way we deal with money, and also that's a market that we are really trying to do. We sell our stuff, we sell our services. And, you know, it's the beginning of the rest of the history. He you know, eventually led Arabia, and Muslims went within three, two, three generations after the Prophet. Muslims were in Multan, Pakistan, currently you know, the Indian subcontinent, currently Pakistan, and then went all the way, they went to like Spain, right, the Iberian Peninsula, all within like eight years. And interestingly, to relate to the other two points about bringing people together, which obviously is relevant to business, but also establishing the masjid. 82 years, I think roughly, that was the 82 years after Prophet's death. When you look at human history, that's nothing, that's a few days, right? 82 years afterwards, they were in Pakistan and Spain, the Muslims, praying the da'wah and telling people about peace and justice, telling them about our rules and about our religion and about our lifestyle and faith, uplifting people wherever they went, filtered those cultures, filtered those concepts, elevated people, and then kill and murder and rape and kill people. Other conquerors throughout history did it, not all of them, Prophet taught us a different way of doing it, so that's not how they conquered, but anyways. Interesting fact is that 82 years later, they were in Pakistan and Spain, where they spread across multiple continents, no internet, no social media, it's very hard to do it that way. They did that, but the Prophet's message hadn't been repaired once yet. It was that same message that, if you've seen the movie The Message, as far as I know, it's somewhat accurate, right? So it's like pillars of palm tree, you know what I'm saying? Like leaves, simple place, some of it's shaded, some of it's not shaded. Some people stayed there and just, they had no place to stay, so they stayed in the courtyard. Simple, basic, maybe like, you know, half of this room, I don't know. That same message that the Prophet and then they built brick walls, whatever it is, that was the same message 82 years later. Now, it's not like that today. Just, we have a beautiful message, there's nothing wrong with that. But it just shows you priorities and shows you values. 82 years after the Prophet's death, they saw they noticed that it was starting to leak, they repaired it, built it, and then you know, it's, you know, continuously people continue to upgrade it and build it and expand it as the Khalif does it. That's a beautiful thing. But the da'wah was a priority. Establishing the market was a priority. Bringing people together, tribes and nations, and everywhere you went, spreading the message was a priority. Teaches teach us to uh, teach us to prioritize things that, that, are, that are worthy. What about Yahada or Safra? Yahada or Safra? Yahada or Safra? Yahada or Safra? I don't know if my voice is carried to the back. I'll try to move it louder or is it good? We don't have a microphone though. Branding and business is an opportunity to not just make a bunch of money. Again, nothing wrong with making money. You use it for good. But also it's an opportunity in of itself. That brand, that business is an opportunity to spread a message. So I want you to, I know it's a lot of new information maybe to some of you. I want you to think about business and branding as an extension of our dialogue. Because it's messaging, branding. It's like a business, a product, a service, an Instagram page, that's your brand. But in it, there, is, there are values, there are words, there are slogans, there are captions, there are there's messaging. So da'wah and business, there's an overlap. And marketing and sales is an overlap. But you know, we can, I, I threw out a number of things, 
Some people might have to go out of classes. Afterwards, we sit, we have a talk, and you guys can ask questions about all these things, inshallah, if you're interested in the topic. I'll leave you with this. Every Muslim I've ever met in my life knows that the country with the biggest Muslim population is Indonesia. Okay? And everyone knows that, or I think a lot of people know this, how they sent me to Indonesia. No Muslim already ever went to Indonesia, yes? Never happened. But it was, it was through business and trade. I think that's common knowledge. Most Muslims, not all Muslims, know this. Tradesmen from Arabia, Yemen, etc. You know, they went to uh, Indonesia. You can kind of see it. You can have basic view of geography. You can kind of see it happening, right? And then sound spread there. I'm gonna add a little bit of detail to that because I studied it. Because I've known this my whole life. I studied how it happened and then found out that the details are, are like it's a story. Obviously, Allah controls the past, the present, the future. All of history is the stories that Allah tells. If you look at the Quran, one third of it is made up of stories. And there's so many different themes in the Quran. But one third is stories of people in the past. So it tells you that Allah knows us and knows what influences us. And stories is very powerful. And it's a cross culture. So this story is typically also the story of Muslims in America. It's something I regularly speak at universities. I think I spoke about that last time I was here. I'm pretty sure it was like a year and a half ago. It was actually the last one on. But the story of Indonesia was fascinating. And I'm going to give it to you in just like two minutes, uh, 30 seconds actually, and then you can ask me questions later. It was through business and trade first and foremost in the Arabian Peninsula and other places. It went through business. Their activities as tradesmen and the way they carried themselves in mannerisms had an influence on people. People asking them questions and finding out about their religion. But we all know this. Eventually what happened is, local leaders became interested in the topic, started asking questions, and a number of them started converting to Islam. And so then certain, a leader would convert, and then that tribe, that village, that city, that little town, would become more confident to convert. Another leader convert, became like a, it became a, became a phenomenon. So they're going back and forth from trade, they're doing business, people find out, they leave, they come back, it's like a whole new Muslim community, you can't imagine it. All right, I'm just briefly going go over like the, uh, the, ta the timeline. What happens also at certain points, Muslims that come back as tradesmen, they realize it's a phenomenon who ask about Islam, they would come back with imams and scholars and students of knowledge. Because they went, they're tradesmen, they're businessmen, they're paying their five prayers, no lying, no cheating, no stealing, that was, that was revolutionary, if you're in a society where that's not common. But they were not the imams, the fuqah, the scholars, etc. Right? They're businessmen, that was the primary thing. Now they probably were, I don't know, alive, I don't know about this, but it's possible they were more knowledgeable than some of our imams and students of knowledge, because it's different standards, but that's fine. They come back with the imams, scholars, and so on, that will stay there, and they'll give that with the villages, and people wanted to hear it. Cool. That's, and we're talking about now, generations, generations, 100 years, 20 years. Eventually, with, as that's happening, in parallel to that as well, what's happening is, sometimes there's intermarriage. A businessman comes, he does a business, he makes money, he marries someone that's Indonesian. He's from Yemen or so on, and she's Indonesian. They get married. Their kids are growing up. You guys get the point? Right. It gets better. Like, I already think that's fascinating and beautiful and amazing how over hundreds of years now, you know, 200 million or so Muslims are in Indonesia. There's, a, there's another piece to it. Like, that, the story is just, it's amazing. Eventually it spreads, like whole areas, again, a ruler becomes, his area becomes Muslim, Muslims, there's certain areas, the business, the market is spreading, Islam is spreading, all of that. At a certain point, the markets are doing so well, Indonesia is on the map, globally, who's interested? Which enemy is interested? The Europeans, the colonists, they're going around the world, they want to steal resources, want to steal labor, they want to save people, colonize people, uh, commit genocide against people, you know the story. Here was particularly which country, do you guys know? It's the Dutch, right? similar to South Africa. Right? It's the British and the French, mainly for the Middle East. Latin America, it's only the Portuguese and the Spanish. Uh, South Africa, some I think the um, certain parts of the Caribbean, I could be mistaken, the British and Dutch. You know, this was this is the Dutch. The Dutch come, and by that point, so this is I don't have the exact years right now on this on these on this notes, but I think that's been like four or five hundred years. Sounds like spreading generations, marriage, so business, dawah, marriage, etc. The Dutch come, and guess what? When they usually wanted to unite to fight against their colonizers, it's a clear reason to unite. They united under the banner of Islam. The rest is history. Alhamdulillah, it's beautiful stuff, think about it. Being a successful entrepreneur means you have time and money in your own hands. Is there anything wrong with graduating from GSU and becoming an employee at a good company, or a hospital, or a law firm, or going to grad school? Nothing wrong with it. But I do want to encourage you, it's one of the things I like to bring up with MSAs, and probably not so common, I know, I know what other speakers are talking about, but I like to bring up the point that as someone, especially if you're born and raised here, especially if you're a citizen, if you're not, you will be in trouble one day. But you have opportunities that your parents probably did not have coming from Senegal, and Gambia, and Nigeria, Indonesia, and Malaysia, Pakistan, and India, Palestine, Egypt, etc. They probably did not have these. From some, from some of these countries, you have to be from a specific, a specific last name, a specific tribe, a specific color, a specific race. In America, it isn't a kind of injustices, but it's not to that extent. It's not like that. The opportunity to start your own businesses. Basically, anybody in America can. If you want to start to succeed, you have that opportunity. I encourage at least a couple of people from every class, from a couple of people from every group, a couple of people to consider it. Others support them. Supporting our Muslim businesses, like I said, is essential for our While money and time are on hands, we need to donate more, take care more. When less that happens, how many of you were thinking, I'm a broke college student, what can I do? What if you had millions and millions of dollars? Would you a little bit more? And we'll talk more about this. 15 things you can do to support the people in Palestine. That's in our talk after the salah. Let's end with the dua. 
All I show is the truth clearly and God is following it. Thanks people of action and not just words. Sincere ambassadors of Islamic Muslims in this country and all over the world. Allah oh, unite our hearts. Allow us to overcome any preconceived notions and erase any stereotypes. Oh, Allah allow us to see peace and justice in our times. Oh, Allah unite our hearts. Allow us to overcome any preconceived notions, racism, stereotypes, spiritual diseases that disunite us. Oh, Allah allow us to show the world that true freedom comes from worshiping you and none besides you, not through following our whims and our desires. Oh, Allah forgive us our sins, have mercy on us, protect us. That is the best in this life and the best in the after. Protect us from the hellfire. Allah atina for dunya hasana. Wa fi al-aqra ti hasana. Bina ala bin nar. Umu ala salatu min hamdullah. Wa fi al-salat. إن صلاة عنا فشل منك الغيرك الله أكبر والله يعلم السلام